the 2 p.m. panel of the afternoon on Integrate and Analyze. Uh, my name is Kathy McEwen, and I'll be moderating the panel. I'm a professor in the Computer Science Department here at Columbia University, and I'm also the inaugural director of the Col Columbia's new Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering. So we're going to start our panel uh, with Susan McGregor, who is an assistant professor in journalism at Columbia University. And she comes here uh, from her work with the Wall Street Journal, where she did a lot of work on, on programming of graphics. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan. It's really great to be here. Um, I've had a little bit of opportunity to, um, to work in the last year and a half with um, the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship here at Columbia um, and sort of talk about some of the issues that uh, we encounter with data um, in journalism. And it's kind of an interesting space for journalists because even though um, what we call in the field computer-assisted reporting has actually been around for decades, it's always, uh, for the most part, been a very niche practice. Um, but I am part of a now swelling number of ranks of folks uh, in the industry who use data and visualization um, and analysis on a regular basis to produce journalism and also to publish um, publish our work. Um, so I just sort of wanted to talk about uh, what, what sort of my background interest in this comes from the fact that having worked in a newsroom, in part because this came from such a uh, small community within the industry, we don't really have a lot of really well-developed practices um, around data management. And um, some of our best efforts we found were, were very shortcoming. And it's interesting because I think that unlike a lot, um, in a way we're coming at this from the opposite direction that a lot of people in universities are, right? Which is that um, as journalists, we're generally not the subject matter experts. We're not the people with the data. We're the people who want to sort of be able to access and interpret the data. Um, and so for us, uh, the sort of integrate and analyze is a really, um, is a fun, is an essential part of it in a way it's almost the way that we discover the data that we use to do our work because um, access to the data set while it can be difficult um, is only the first part of making it useful for what we do um, and the the necessity to integrate that with the expertise of uh, researchers in the field is what actually lets us uh, draw value from it so this is an example of coverage from the Guardian UK um, during the 2011 riots there. Um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with this. Um, you probably heard the, you know, you probably heard about this story. Um, what I think was really unique about the the use of data, and this comes from the data blog at the Guardian, which is perhaps best known for its work in the WikiLeaks um, case. Uh, <laughs> just prior to this, um, was that the work that the, that the Guardian did and why this was so, the sort of integrate and analyze part of this, was that they used a combination of data sources um, in order to sort of discover and tell the story of the UK riots. Um, so what you're seeing right here is a sort of a, a variation on a map, and I won't, I won't risk trying to go to the live version. Um, but what you're seeing is, is uh, sort of the, the integration of multiple data sets. So what The Guardian did was a combination of use, using user reports. Um, one of the biggest parts of this story when it broke was just trying to find out where the riots were happening. Um, it was really, it, it really caused a, a, quite a panic in the UK actually, um, the way that these riots spread around the country. And, um, and therefore, in the, in the very early hours of this story, the real question was just, where are these things happening? Um, and so the Guardian essentially put out a call. Uh, a lot of their, you know, a lot of their readers, users uh, who use social media, called in reports, texted, used social media to, to send in reports about where riots were happening. Um, and they produced, in the end, a very, very simple map, um, almost rudimentary uh, map, that just showed where the riots were taking place. Um, and that was extremely effective. It was actually this very basic map was the number one traffic page on their site for two days running, which uh, for The Guardian, which is a leader in, uh, in online traffic, was a really big deal. Um, but what you're looking at here is actually the integration of that data set with two other data sets. Um, one is the location, um, is the location, the, the home addresses of suspects who were arrested for riot-related offenses um, in, the, in the days following the start of the riots. And this was an essential part because, of course, after something like this happens, um, you want to know not just where it's happening, but who is doing it and, of course, why. Um, and the Guardian's analysis was, ex was 
instrumental in this um, because what they did was after gathering court records, they actually had to get an order from the Ministry of Justice um, to uh, allow for the wholesale release of uh, arrest records from around the UK. They went through and coded each of them. This is probably the closest to what the researchers in the room are familiar with, right? They went, they went through and they coded each arrest record um, to determine whether or not based on location, offense, um, and, uh, and time, whether it was a riot-related offense. And then they overlaid that with, um, with demographic data. This is called the Deprivation Index um, in the UK, which is basically a measure of poverty. Um, and this was all inspired by the fact that David Cameron had made a public statement that the riots had nothing to do with poverty. Um, and <laughs> which seems remarkable, uh, which is exactly what the editor thought and which is why this analysis was performed. Um, it also produced some of the, one of, some of the, the larger insights of the story, which was uh, the so-called, understood as the so-called riot commute, um, which in understanding what was happening was looking at where people were rioting and, and actually even before this part of the story was told um, was, was contrasting where, arrest, uh, where uh, arrested suspects lived versus where they had rioted. And, um, and this became interpreted as the riot commute. And what was discovered was that it was actually a very organized effort. It wasn't um, people sort of running into the streets enraged. Um, they were leaving their homes. They were getting on the nearest train. They were traveling to city centers. And then they were rioting in particular locations and at particular times, which gave a very different flavor to the understanding of, of what was going on. Um, so this is an example from, from our field of, of, where, uh, of how integrating and analyzing data is important. And I guess um, you know, the thing for us is that we are always cross-referencing um, across lots of different types of data, um, lots of different areas of expertise. Um, and in, sometimes we're doing this based on a background. Um, you know, this, is, this is sort of the reporter's intuition, which really tends to be sort of collected implicit knowledge is, is what I would characterize it at. It's a subject matter expertise that we accrue, but we don't always document in the same way. Um, this is a second piece from that same coverage package, and um, this came from, was inspired by another statement of David Cameron's, which was that social media like Facebook and Twitter had been used to organize these riots, and therefore needed, um, the, the UK government needed a so-called red button to be able to shut down these services in the case of uh, public emergency. Um, and this is a pretty significant issue, particularly in the UK, which doesn't have the same kind of press protections as we have in the US. Um, and so this could have, of course, been a, a pretty significant threat to communication and press liberty there, um, it already, social media already produces some sort of weird conflicts uh, in what's allowed to be reported about. Um, but again, what we see here is this is uh, based on the user reports of when particular events, when uh, rioting began to happen um, in particular places, and this is uh, data that they obtained from Twitter. They asked, they reached out to Twitter and said, hey, can we have um, all the tweets that are tagged with this, this particular hashtag? And, um, and then they looked at the traffic on those tweets. What you see here actually, which is the largest spike, that black line um, is actually the hashtag riot cleanup, um, which saw the greatest and most sustained volume of traffic on social media. Of course, later, in part, I think, because of this, um, because of the, the doubt that this cast, um, the issue was explored further. And it was found, of course, that the uh, protesters mostly uh, had been uh, organizing uh, through BlackBerry Messenger. right? Um, and what's interesting, which is, which is not public, because guess what? They know that everybody can see that stuff. Um, <laughs> Um, so this is another example, and, and I think what's important here and, and, and sort of how it ties into the research community as well is that, um, you know, this is obviously not a statistical analysis, right? And of course, um, I'm sure Mark will <laughs> have things to share on that. But, but one of the things that they did, one of the things that they did, and this is, this is how journalism both benefits from, you know, sort of more, uh, more academic research practices, but of course serves a different function, which is that the function of this graph was to call into question the story being offered, the storyline being offered by the government. Um, in point of fact, actually, The Guardian did collaborate with researchers um, at the University of Manchester and LSE later that year who did do the statistical analysis and confirm that, in fact, there was no correlation between social media traffic on Facebook and Twitter and um, the activity of the riots. So this is another example where, again, we sort of take um, 
we take data and we have to integrate it. I had the opportunity, this, um, this is a Medi Medicare fraud uh, case. This is the graphic from a series of Medicare fraud stories that were reported by a former colleague of mine from the Wall Street Journal, um, Maurice Tamman, who is one of the leaders in computer-assisted reporting. Um, and I, I had the opportunity to interview him about the kind of work that he does in this case. And um, while it does rely on large volumes of data, again, it's important to recognize that we don't have the expertise around this data. Um, and very often, things like like what the column names mean in your table uh, are extremely opaque to us. Or for example, with medical records, as I'm sure many, everyone here is familiar, right, are very opaquely coded as to what actually the entries mean. Um, and so uh, when I asked him about his process on this, in addition to successfully obtaining the data, which was several billion records, um, still only fi about 5% of the Medicare records for that year, um, he, uh, the filings, many of which were redundant and there were all kinds of, all kinds of issues with them, uh, was that he was working with, um, he basically had some expert contacts at Dartmouth University um, and he would work with them and just say, what, what should I be looking for? What's unusual? What, what are these things? Um, and basically through that and sort of a, applying, you know, typical, you know, search and analysis methods, um, was able to identify um, the, the folks that you see here. Um, the, the, uh, the outlier in the very top right corner is a, a particular doctor here in New York who was performing very unusual procedures for um, their particular, it was a, I believe a, it's either a pediatrician or a, a GP uh, who is performing extremely sophisticated tests um, and all of the other bubbles are, uh, the, the gray ones are actually people who had been uh, reviewed for misconduct um, and sort of this, this, led, this has led to prosecution and to a review of the methods by many of the people who were involved in it. Um, so a really important part of, of this was, was engaging the subject matter expert to decode this information. Um, this is, another, this is another example. This is actually not by a traditional journalist. This is by um, a data scientist at um, something called Social Flow. And in this case, they, uh, he basically, the, the Coney 2012 phenomenon that some of you may have, may have heard about on social media, he kind of reverse engineered what had happened um, and how this viral, uh, this, this thing went viral. And the important thing about it, or the really uh, interesting thing about it is that, especially in the online world, there's been a lot of uh, thinking recently that you know the all of these these uh, things go viral you know just online it's all digital um, and essentially his analysis of uh, who was who was tweeting when and looking at information about their geography where they were as well as uh, as uh, information from their profile which identified them uh, as as people who were part of um, religious youth movements actually what they what he was able to to deduce was essentially that the people who sort of tipped the scales on this online viral this online viral phenomenon were uh, were actually part of a large uh, in-person ground network that had been connected with the organization that was promoting this event uh, for a long long time uh, so it kind of gave lie to the idea that this is just the kind of thing that explodes spontaneously which might be obvious to some who are kind of familiar with these systems, but, but went against the common understanding at the time. Um, so uh, that's all I wanted to share is sort of how we use these practices and to say that, you know, one of the things that, that I personally and many of my colleagues are interested in is, you know, we like everyone uh, in, jur in journalism, like in many other industries, we are, uh, you know, facing a reduction in resources. And one of the things is that we're st there's still a somewhat permeating mentality in the industry of the idea of yesterday's news. And so um, developing practices that are efficient for us to um, gather metadata, uh, produce things that are reproducible, I know it was a topic earlier today, um, and be able to leverage that forward so that the, the knowledge, similar to researchers in the room that is cultivated by these reporters, isn't, isn't lost when they leave an organization or finish a story, um, but can actually be used by, uh, by other journalists um, in much the same way that, that the academic discussion is happening here is extremely important to us. So um, looking forward to sort of of hearing what everyone has to say and, and how we can improve these processes. Okay, our uh, second panelist is going to be coming to us from uh, Skype. I hope you can pull that up. Her name is Heather Piawar. She's co-founder of Impact Story. Um, and this is a web application that helps scholars tell how their research has had impact. And she'll be talking about the different me metrics that she uses. 
Thanks so much for Skyping me in. I'm really sad to not be there. Uh, you are my people, and I wish I were there. Uh, the reason I'm not is because I'm busy coding Impact Story to make it even better. Uh, come, new improvements coming soon to you. Uh, but what I'm going to be doing in this talk um, is putting um, analyzing data in the context of uh, impact, and specifically analyzing data about our data. So I will be talking about research data. I won't be talking about uh, slicing and dicing that research data, but instead slicing and dicing the impact about the research data. So consider it a segue to the next section. Uh, that's what I was invited to talk about, and so I hope that, that it will stir some great conversation. So what we want to do is understand the impact of our data sets. And something that we, and I'll include myself in this, that we as data uh, data loving people, data set loving people often forget is that impact is not just citations. Citations are a bit of a holy grail. We don't have them uh, working well yet. We desperately want them, but they're not the whole story and we will lose out big time if we think they're the whole story. It's important that we take a step back and think about all the data we need to analyze about impact. Specifically, there are many types of engagements. So there are views, people look at our data. There are saves, people bookmark our data for looking at it later. There are discussions, people talk about data. Uh, not explicitly in here is the fact they're analyzing data actually um, and potentially talking about it um, with their lab groups or, or online. There are formal references when people refer to data in formal publications, and then people can recommend uh, data sets, again, formally or informally. These are all different types of engagement. There are also different uh, people who do these engagements. So one is researchers, another is teachers, uh, students, policymakers, practitioners. When we think about just uh, journal citations to data sets, as you can imagine, we miss a lot of the, both of these pictures. So journal article citations specifically is a formal reference from a scholar. A journal citation in-text link, or for example, mentioning an accession number in a method section, that's a formal reference from a scholar too, right? It's not using the established mechanisms we have for doing that in the citation list, and so it misses out on a lot of the tools and a lot of the social uh, uh, norms that go along with the reference list, but it is, it is still a formal reference from a scholar. A blog of an in-text link, one characterized as an informal discussion, uh, potentially from a scholar if it's a scholar's blog. A tweet of a data set link or a data set ID is an informal discussion from a scholar. Uh, if that scholar, if the tweeter is a scholar, it may also be an indication uh, that a teacher, a student, a policymaker, a journalist, right, others are interested in our data sets. Mendeley or Delicious are different ways to bookmark, uh, to save uh, data sets for future reference. And those, we, we, there are some metrics uh, that talk about who uh, and for what reason, but there's lots that's not known there yet. When data is put on GitHub, for example, or when software is put on GitHub, um, they have a mechanism for a star, and other data repositories um, can have that too, which can mean a recommendation by someone. All of these different things are ways of following the, uh, following the engagement um, of, of a community or communities uh, with our data sets um, in a very broad sense. And as those uh, engagements move online, uh, we can begin to track them. Now, sometimes some types of tracking are creepy uh, and aren't appropriate, but some types of tracking are very appropriate and things that we should be building. I heard that chuckle. <laughs> and things that we should be building into our tool um, and into our platforms. And this is, in fact, the, the social norm in social media today. So. Um, uh, Twitter, uh, we just heard uh, Twitter and, and uh, Mendeley and others have APIs that expose uh, engagements at appropriate at an appropriate level of granularity and, a, and an accepted level of granularity. So as our engagements move online, we can track them and then we can analyze data about our data. And from this, we can um, inform our policies, uh, incent people to share their data, uh, learn um, to build our tools, all the things that I think uh, people have been talking about earlier today and we'll uh, talk about later again. This, this, 
all when we think about all the different types of engagement and all the different types of engagers, it lets us move from a metric of is the data available or not, yes or no, uh, past the metric of has the data been used as a as measured by citations, uh, which is good, uh, but still just one dimensional um, that doesn't capture everything and it makes a one dimensional set of winners and losers to a real palette, uh, which I like to think of as a flavor palette, um, and which I like to think of in terms of ice cream because ice cream is delicious. So, um, so People could argue that there's one best kind of ice cream, say chocolate, and many people would agree with them. Uh, but that really depends on your use. Most people do not put chocolate ice cream on their apple pie, right? And yet most people love having apple pie with ice cream, uh, probably with vanilla. And so we need some vanilla ice cream to exist as well. Lots of people love uh, champagne ice cream. There's just lots of kinds of ice cream. We want them all to exist, which means we need different spectra, different dimensions on which to measure them and value them. For example, there could be data sets uh, that are useful um, as a standalone reanalysis to build another um, hypothesis and, and test another hypothesis. That's one type of use and should be recognized and valued for what it is. It's possible there's another type of data set uh, that's not used in formal publications, but it's a great teaching data set. And teachers all over have it on their syllabi and students learn all sorts of things about it and it's never cited, right? We really want to be able to identify that kind of impact and recognize it for what it is. There could be other data sets that don't make much many waves in the scholarly literature, but you know what? They do a great job of informing a Guardian piece, which, which, uh, which makes a big difference uh, in public perception. There's, there's many types of data sets. Um, it's important that we analyze the data about our data uh, to be able to get these nuances. And I'll mention, because I often, uh, I, I often don't because it's still in the future, <laughs> that um, all of these things that I've talked about are, are largely in terms of quantitative numbers, but obviously what we really want to get to is qualitative information and real world changing impact. That's still beyond most of what we can do, but that's that's obviously the goal, to, to measure impact flavor um, even more deeply than, than is simple today. So how can we do all of this? Uh, what is possible now? what data exists and how can we analyze it. I'm going to go through these uh, briefly and then hopefully we can have good questions at the end after all the sessions. So I'm going to be talking about this in the context of Impact Story, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, web application that I've co-founded with Jason Prem uh, with the goal what and I, I've done that because, as many of you know, my research passion is in uh, understanding patterns of data sharing and reuse and understanding those patterns to help inform policies and to help create incentives uh, for effective and efficient data sharing. And the tools just didn't exist to do that, right? And I got impatient and tired of waiting and started to build the world that we want to see. Um, and so, so the application exists right now at impactstory.org. Uh, it's founded by the Sloan Foundation, um, and it currently um, tracks impacts for all sorts of metrics, including data sets. I encourage you to check it out. Um, here's a picture of, <laughs> of a, what Impact Story does. Is a uh, is for a scholar, it collects all their diverse sorts of research products and shows diverse metrics about them. So articles, but also data sets. So here are my data sets for articles that I've published. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, uh, there's an indication that they've been viewed. Um, if you click on them, you can drill in and see those views. Uh, we're characterizing them uh, dryad uh, downloads as views by scholars. Um, I'll, I'll dig into this um, on another slide in more detail. Um, but so Impact Story um, collects all these different impacts and shows them in context and makes the data openly available. Um, I want to be quick to mention that it's only one tool that exists now to do this. Um, Altmetric.com has a bookmarklet and, an, and a tool that will track data sets that have DOIs, excuse me, Plum Analytics, um, tracks uh, various kinds of diverse products, including data sets. And the Data Citation Index um, currently tracks citations um, for aggregate citations from data repositories that have identified them themselves, uh, I believe is the current status of that. 
And so go check those out. Um, my examples will be from Impact Story, but um, these are these are other products that do um, often similar things. Okay, so number one, uh, what do we need to do to bring about a world where we can do a better job of analyzing the data about our data? The first thing is we need more data. <laughs> we need more data about our data to be available. Uh, we, and what that means, uh, for one thing, is more metrics to be exposed. So Dryad and Figshare and others, uh, lots of uh, institutional data repositories, uh, display uh, the number of times that data sets have been viewed and downloaded. Um, which is fantastic and facilitates a lot of this work. Um, it, it's even better when it's available via an API, but we can talk about that more later. Uh, ICPSR and ORNL DAC and others uh, take it a step further and go and hunt down citations um, and make those citations available as data about the data. Uh, ICPSR does uh, is really a leader in, in data about our data. They furthermore break down um, how many downloads are from data sets versus documentation. Then they take it a step further and say, when people have been logged in and downloaded, what have they uh, said is their um, uh, role in their institution? Are they faculty, grad students, undergrads, um, or others? And that this, when you break it down like this and when you break it down by institution, you can really start to get some of that impact flavor um, bubbling up to the top. And this is done obviously in a way that does uh, respect uh, privacy and doesn't do things that people uh, don't expect, which is the balancing job um, uh, when mining logs. So there's best practice ways to do this. Uh, here are some examples. They're still pretty rare on the ground. Uh, doing more of this will help um, us understand impact better. Secondly, more support for all types of engagement. So right now, um, the, when metrics exist, they largely exist uh, to show downloads uh, and to show views. But that certainly isn't all of the research lifecycle. Uh, um, there are not very many tools that exist right now to let someone bookmark a data set for, for a later reference. Um, you can put them in Delicious or a site you like or Mendeley, but the support there isn't great yet. Uh, we really need to advocate for good support. Often maybe those tools can come in our data repositories. I don't know, but it's an underserved area right now. Um, similarly, ways to recommend data sets uh, are pretty weak. This, there's a full palette of this for articles, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but the the tools to support this kind of web native engagement for data uh, are still really weak. And so hence, there's not much data there uh, for us to, to look at for, to track impact. And the third in this point um, is that we need more derived metrics uh, with more context. So understanding that um, a data set on Dryad has 1,906 package views sounds kind of like a lot, uh, but who knows? Is that actually a lot? Uh, really, nobody knows. Um, so when we show it on Impact Story, for example, we give that raw number, and importantly, you can click on that raw number uh, to drill into the Dryad page and see, see more information, but we also give um, a percentile. So that 97, 100 at the top line right there near that little blue bar, that's the percentile uh, that that views is compared to other data sets deposited that same year in Dryad. Uh, the 255 total downloads is between the 89th and the 97th percentile of all data sets deposited in Dryad that year. This kind of giving context to our numbers is really important um, and, and requires uh, data to do that. The fact that it's a range uh, is because there's ties and it also includes uh, 95 percentiles, 95 percentiles. Um, yeah, so this is another example of how these badges are tied uh, to context. We need our data about data to be more open so that we can mash it up, right? <laughs> we can't, you can do all the analysis you want uh, if you can get the data and if you can show your analysis again, uh, then it's useful. This means open text mining of articles because that's where a lot of the uh, impact uh, information is not all of it but a whole lot and a lot of important stuff that people currently care about we need open data from repositories so these download counts and understanding how the download counts were derived and understanding metadata about the download uh, about divisions of the download counts things like that and finally and crucially we also need open metrics from our aggregators so the 
the current world that we have with articles are that uh, Scopus and Web of Science and Google Scholar, their citation metrics are not open data, which severely limits how people can um, build tools on top of that. Um, we want a different world uh, for data sets. And so these aggregators uh, really ought to have open data for us to make full use um, of, of learning uh, how to understand impact from them. Heather, Sorry. you have about two minutes left. Perfect, because I'm on point number three. So point number one was more data about our data. Point number two is that it should be more open. And point number three is that we need to raise awareness uh, that, that ways to track data exist uh, and that those ways can get better. So, so continuing to raise awareness that people can put their data sets on their CV. Furthermore, they can put them there with some context about how much has happened with them recently. And this is really encouraged, for example, uh, by the NSF policy, I'm sure you've mentioned uh, today already, uh, to, to support uh, listing data sets. Um, I, encouraging people to list their um, the metrics that show that those data sets have had an impact will drive demand for more of this and will drive change, uh, which is what we need to see if we are to get to a world with long lineups for ice cream, <laughs> where, uh, where we have good information um, about what kind of ice cream uh, is in the most demand and the most loved. Thanks very much. So our final panelist is Mark Hansen. Mark is the respondent for the panel. Um, so we'll see how he responds to what others have said. Mark is a director of the Brown Institute for Media in Innovation. He's also chair of the New Media Center in the Institute for Data Science and Engineering, and he's a professor of journalism at Columbia University. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm also pleased that we have two members of the School of Journalism here today showing our data chops. Um, you wouldn't have thought about it from journalism, right? We made it. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, what I thought I would do is, uh, uh, I, I've written up some reactions to the first two presentations, and I thought I would give you a little context for those reactions once uh, the slides come up. Uh, do you want me to try re? Uh... Uh, and thank you, Jen, for the dongle. Room full of Max, one dongle. <laughs> yeah, um, there you are. There we are. Yeah, it's good. Oh. All right, so uh, the first slide is simply that I'm from the Brown Institute. For those of you who haven't heard of it, it's, uh, it was uh, an institute uh, 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 created about just over a year ago, uh, $30, million, $30 million gift from Helen Gurley Brown, pictured here with her husband, David. Um, uh, the institute exists to co-evolve uh, technology and storytelling uh, and is housed in the School of Journalism. Um, in the idea of, or looking at the, the idea of um, uh, integrate and analyze, I thought I would present very briefly two works that I've uh, been involved in. Um, I'm in the School of Journalism, but I am, I, I, I'm just going to come out, pu out myself publicly. I am not a journalist. I'm a statistician by training, um, uh, and I'm learning very quickly what it means to be a journalist. Um, so uh, uh, the, the first project that I'll talk about it actually deals quite nicely with metrics. Uh, this is a project uh, with Jer Thorpe, uh, who was the, at the time the data artist in residence in the New York Times, and I was having a sabbatical there. Uh, the project is called Cascade, uh, and it was the, the subject of my sabbatical was to figure out how people were sharing uh, New York Times links across Twitter. Um, in terms of integrate, we had data from a variety of sources. We had uh, people's browsing behavior, so we can watch you browsing the New York Times site. We had some data from Bitly, so we watched you take a, a long URL and shorten it. Bitly, uh, the URL shortener also is nyti.ms, so uh, we saw most of the people who were shortening things on the New York Times. We saw that, tw that uh, shortened link appear on Twitter tweets and retweets, saw people clicking on those tweets, coming back to the site and browsing. So we had a full, if you will, cascade of events that were kicked off by your activity of browsing the site in the morning and tweeting about it. Um, our goal was to uh, create a visualization. Here it is. Um, 
Uh, this is a particular story. Time is running along the x-axis. Uh, every pink dot you see is a tweet. Every yellow dot is someone coming back to the site that is clicking on that tweet. Um, all of these tweets are about a particular story called, But Will It Make You Happy? This story was uh, about uh, should you be buying things or experiences? Um, so you see people sort of clicking. The height of the display uh, has to do with the, uh, how far away you are. So as you retweet other people, you get farther and farther away. At the very top, there's a histogram that's uh, 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 counting the number of tweets. Uh, and then at some moment, things explode. Um, so you see that like, large spike happening in the histogram. Uh, you can climb up the backbone of the cascade and see that this, uh, that this uh, chain became with a, started with a tweet from Valdis Krebs. You can follow along until you find that that huge spike of activity came when the Zappos CEO tweeted about the, uh, uh, about the uh, story, which is interesting because Zappos is the company that sells you shoes and various <laughs> things. So to be tweeting about um, an article of this sort says something about how uh, corporations are uh, the presence that they're managing on Twitter. What I wanted to show you here, though, uh, uh, the, the Twitter context is important, and I suppose resonates given the um, the uh, the impact that we were talking about before. But this is a non-standard data visualization. This is a piece of uh, of code that is acting as an exploratory tool. You can get this. Uh, you can get a display like this uh, for any of the of the New York Times stories, for any of the cascades around their stories, and you can start to drill in. You can look at the networks that were activated when people uh, uh, tweet about uh, certain topics. Um, uh, but it's an exploratory tool. It's not giving you hard answers. It's living somewhere between that hard edge statistics and, 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 ana and, and um, informal analysis. Uh, here are some views. Um, the second project I wanted to mention uh, is, is like, as with this exploratory example, meant to loosen up what we might mean by analyze. Um, uh, I've had the good fortune of working on a number of public artworks. Um, which go statistician, go, <laughs> go media art. Um, so the piece I'm going to describe here, it sort of brings analyze to a di in a different context. Uh, this is a site-specific piece. It's uh, at the public theater in, uh, here in, in the city. Um, it's uh, actually this thing that hovers above the bar. Uh, have many of you been at the public? to see, I expected in this crowd there'd be at least a few of you. Um, uh, uh, so it's called the Shakespeare machine. There are 37 blades, why? Shakespeare, 37, right? That's the number of plays in the folio. Um, and so one blade for each play. Each blade displays a separate, uh, a separate uh, 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 data from or text from a separate play. Uh, here's the piece in action. Um, this, uh, uh, if it, Starts, please. Yeah, no, uh, here it goes. Uh, this is uh, the inevitable show your work scene where we just show all the text from all the plays. Um, we then have a, 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 a program again in the integrate and analyze. Analysis here is looking at for different rhetorical structures that Shakespeare used. Uh, this, for example, is looking at all the hyphenates that uh, were used in each of the plays. So again, each blade is showing the hyphenates from a separate play. Um, we also benefiting from the hard work from the digital humanities, um, leveraged the Monk database, and uh, uh, went on a, 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 a uh, uh, an analysis, if you will, that um, what we were referring to is anaphora mining, looking for the rhetorical structures that Shakespeare used and highlighting those. So here, for example, um, we're looking for patterns like uh, uh, liberal and free, um, idle and, I can't read it from here. Um, so we're looking to automatically extract those rhetorical structures, pattern in part of speech usage, in specific word usage, or in thematics. Is this garden imagery? Is this water imagery? Um, again, we're basically making use of the, the, the byproducts of digital humanities work that to a statistician, uh, I can think of six parts of speech, but these folks gave us 150 different parts of speech, which I'm a little <laughs> intimidated by. Um, but if you start to extract those parts of speech, you find that across all the plays, there were 3,404 occurrences of a determiner, an adjective, and a singular noun. You break those apart, and it's a lovely list because it's really hard to kill Shakespeare, even when you treat him as data. Um, so. What I wanted to, to to say with those examples is that is that um, that 
while oftentimes my discipline, statistics, will push forward data as a very technical object, data also exists to support a variety of creative practices, and that the work that's being done in that area can give back to statistics, can give back to data science. In a sense, data science or a larger understanding of data should integrate practices coming from a variety of places. Um, which also comes back to the, the idea of, of a statistician sitting in a school of journalism. I'm teaching a class this semester called Journalistic Computing, um, and one of the things I'm finding is that when journalists are in control of the technology, when you start to train and question journalists about the tools that they would like to see or the ways in which they perform, the, the fundamentally journalistically inflected technology will look different than computer science created technology. Right? There are a different set of values, transparency and so on, that come with journalism that will change and shape the way technology, data technologies look. Right? And so in part, the call to data science, the call to the Data Sciences Institute is to integrate those practices, is to integrate the different ways that different disciplines now are making use of data, bring that to a kind of larger, broader understanding. Um, I guess I'll finish with the, uh, just the basic idea that you all, that you all know that that data at, at their core, whether it's measuring impact or looking at sociological phenomena, data at their core are fundamentally human. That without human effort, huma without observation, without memory, we don't have data. And that the analysis of that data should be just as human. My poor field statistics often is charged with sucking the life out of the kind of analysis and creativity that people might have with data, and I'd like to see ways to bring it back again. Um, I think I'll stop there. Okay, so we now have time for discussion. And um, as moderator, I think I'll kick it off with a question to the panelists myself. Um, since I'm from computer science. Um, <laughs> um, well, my question probably goes a bit more to the other two than to you, Mark, but um, I'm, I'm curious how much of the kind of analysis that you're doing can um, be done automatically and where we look for, for pulling things together from dis different disciplines where um, you might look to computer scientists for um, things which you would like to be able to do but perhaps are not able to yet. So I'm wondering in particular about the analysis of unstructured data like uh, text, video, or speech. Um, so Susan, you, you talked about the um, analysis of the Medicare data and needed to be able to look at the columns. And mm -hmm. You still then had a <clears throat> table or a chart and I'm wondering whether if you're able to look in at some kind of text, if that could tell you more. And uh, for Heather, I would ask in your analysis of citations, whether if you're able to look in at the text and to see what people are saying about the citations, if that could help you more in terms of coming up with impact. So maybe Susan? Um, thank you, yeah. Um, so I, I'll also take this as an opportunity to do a small plug, which is that also at the journalism school, I'm part of something called the Tau Center for Digital Journalism, um, which, uh, among other things, oversees a dual degree program in computer science and journalism. Uh, so uh, I think in journalism, uh, I mean, our field is actually turning very much towards computer science, and um, in, in, at least insofar as you say it is sort of, we're very pragmatic people, right? So we want to solve a problem. Um, and um, you know, text analysis, I think, is one of those things where, um, as journalists, there, there are a lot of things that we can do, and I have a, a bit of a background in computer science, but when we start to talk about text processing, natural language processing, um, that's where the sort of um, lower, lower level tools are really not, um, are not as successful. Um, and I think that there is an enormous amount of uh, capacity. I mean, it's both in the journalism and frankly in the commercial world um, for there's enormous uh, appetite for that kind of analysis because ultimately it's not just, um, 
you know, I mean, I think something like WikiLeaks is a is a perfect example. And and what we tend to do uh, often, or, or where the our field is moving, uh, is both in reaching out to computer science and reaching out to our audience. Um, and I think this is actually where uh, you know some of what Heather was talking about uh, really sort of resonates is this idea that we can um, look at what people are doing with our data and uh, and saying about it. Uh, her example brought to mind the fact that the Guardian data blog that I mentioned was one of the first. Uh, outlets to aggressively publish the data behind their articles. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the ways that they generated such uh, an active readership. Um, and they also very often put out calls to their readers um, to do analysis and visualization and say, what do you make of this? I know they're running a contest right now. So I think there's a two-pronged approach. Um, the challenge is that, um, again, as journalists, we don't have the expertise all the time, and so uh, it's, it's, it's hard to engage the computer science when you don't know what you're looking for. Um, but at the same time, uh, and, and so for us, the, the, the flip side of that is engaging our readers who very often um, have expertise that we don't have. Okay. Heather, do you want to comment? Yeah, I'd love to comment. Um, it's a great point. So I think in terms of text analysis, which maybe I'll, I'll just answer it from that perspective, there is a lot that we could learn from computer science um, and, and that computer science could help with. In fact, it's a frustration for me, a huge frustration that um, that computer scientists right now often uh, use uh, movie reviews and they use um, uh, Twitter archives and things for doing their uh, text analysis because our research papers aren't available for them to uh, easily mine. And this means that um, the every every text mining uh, problem is e most easily customized. It works best when it's customized to the type of content. Um, and we're behind on um, doing text analysis on the type of writing that scientific papers and other research is written in because that text isn't available. Um, so, so some of the things that computer scientists w right now doing uh, using the type of uh, queries that we can easily do, which is binary queries uh, um, uh, on, on text that isn't open access. Um, we, we can't even find out when, when, some, when there's a reference to a data set in text if it's a reference in the context of the data having been produced by the authors of that paper and they're saying where, had it, where it has been deposited, or is it in the context of someone using that data and, and it's about their paper. Believe me, I've tried to do this and it is really, and others have tried too, and it is not easy and that is the most simple of tasks. Uh, right now, it's it's unstructured data, uh, but it's important to go beyond that too, right? And understand uh, when the, when it's been reused, was it uh, the only data set that was reused in that paper? Was it an important part of the um, paper's conclusions? Uh, was it just one of many things? Are they critiquing it? Um, there is there are efforts going on to try to structure that data using the cyto ontology. Uh, for citations, for example, but the adoption there is going to be tricky, and having a real NLP people focusing on those problems uh, would be key. Uh, and I'll just segue, I'll just mention a little that um, similarly mentions in blogs and mentions in comments and understanding whether those are, are critiques or uh, additions or whatever, that's all key to the impact story for sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I would. Um just a plug for my own research because we are uh, doing um, natural language analysis of journal articles under a project funded by um, IARPA. And so we are looking at some of these issues that would be you know, great to get together with you and talk about how we could combine our talents. But I, I would second your um, plug. All our data we can only access on the government's computers um, because um, the, with the, uh, uh, the, the publishers have not made it open access. So we have to do all our computation <laughs> not on our local computers precisely because of the copyright issues. So I if I can you on that. <laughs> If I could just jump in to say that's not an excuse for any of us, right? And I think you would agree with this. We need to keep asking and we need to keep demanding. Both you never know what you're going to get and people won't give it to unless they recognize that there's a real uh, need. So we all need to ask and I think that's part of our responsibility. Okay. 
All right, so let's open up to the audience. Yeah? I would recommend that you do your analysis and open it. Please wait for the mic. Oh. Over here in the front. I would recommend that you do your analysis on open access articles. This way, you're ignoring the publisher's works that they're not enabling you to use, and you're rewarding the open access articles. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do on open access as well, but there's an order of magnitude larger number of articles uh, that we have available to us that are not open access. So we like to work at scale also. All right, other questions? Yeah, I, I, uh, Peter Murray Rust, I'd just like to second all of that, that the lack of access to material is not just the stuff you're going to mine, it is the whole infrastructure of natural language processing. It's the dictionaries, the ontologies, the um, gold standards, the tests, everything. You know, This is required for high quality uh, text mining and you have to have access uh, to this. And it simply held us back by years. It's as simple as that. Okay, other comments? We have over on this side. Uh, so this is a general question about integration. So um, how would you describe in simple words what you think are the most challenging barriers for you in integrating heterogeneous data? So well, uh, it's more about the structure, it's more about the semantics, I don't know, whatever you think. Um, I, I would say in our field, uh, for journalism, one of the biggest problems we have is just this the siloed coding. Um, so, I mean, the coding as in the encoding of the same entity with different references um, and the inability, the lack of knowledge about how to correlate those, um, you know, followed by just sort of format differences, right? Um, uh, so that, that's, a big, that's a big issue for us. I guess I would I would say that um, uh, a, a big issue also is is um, knowing what the integration's actually done. When you zipper two things together, a certain amount of stuff falls on the floor. Like, have you you know have you what have you left behind? What you know often when you're doing this on large data sets, um, it's it's a little bit difficult to know what's there and what's been what you know what, what sort of systematic things might have happened in the process. So um, training in, in statistics anyway, training students to to start to ask those questions, right? To interrogate that process a little bit more, to open it up a little bit more, and then also to document, right? To document because those steps are often steps that are. You know, maybe, maybe it happens in a spreadsheet somewhere. Maybe it happens in a. And you know, how do you document that? How do you keep track of those steps so someone later can build on it? Heather, I'd say data that isn't exposed uh, from our tools and data that isn't open. We have other comments. I have a question for Heather, uh, but others are welcome to if you like to respond. So one of our colleagues pointed out uh, that tenure is a very strong motivator in our community. And uh, during your presentation, it occurred to me that um, um, what would appear in a tenure or promotion packet of the future would be an interesting thing to wireframe. Could you describe some of the components? I mean, I think you had a slide eventually that uh, uh, had some features on it. But what, what would you expect to see there? For sure. And I'll, in fact, uh, take the opportunity to plug a publication uh, that I had in January it, uh, in Nature, which is not an open access publication, I will admit. It was a comment, so please shoot, uh, shoot me now. So, um, so I think that uh, the great thing about alternative products and including those in tenure and in grant applications, which are key times uh, and hiring, which are key times when people are making the case that they've had impact. Um, a great thing about alternative products like data sets is they don't have an established uh, impact 
uh, thing to rely on, like journal impact factor, uh, and they they can't easily get one. Um, and that means that the the impact metrics, I think, will be data set level. They won't be about the container. They won't be about where it's hosted. They'll be about the impact that that particular item has made. And so I think that um, that that those metrics uh, should be sometimes quantitative with numbers and context and context that's relevant for that particular situation, whether it's discipline specific or data type specific or, um, and I think they should also often be qualitative. So, so the quantitative numbers are often a place to drill in and start to see um, who's done what with it and, and, and find the deeper story. And so there should often be a sentence or two uh, like that. I think some funders are starting to um, suggest having sentences like that um, that accompany grants. You know, if I can add to that, the, the interesting thing, so um, uh, the, um, the, the, the idea that a data set or in my field code would be counted in a, in a tenure case is a little bit difficult because you end up, um, I think that the, the tenure committees don't quite know what to do. They don't recognize the amount of work that goes into a piece of code, the amount of work that goes into data. So the, the publication, obviously, that's the priority, right? And then the code and the amount of time and the community that gives, it's sort of hard to evaluate those. And so I think maybe the, the wireframe of the future has to have something that would help a tenure committee you know, expose or give an appropriate amount of, um, uh, an appropriate amount of, of, of weight to that. Um, the other thing is that, that um, you almost don't want to wireframe it too closely because I feel like telling a story from the data, like using the methods that, or using the metrics that, that Heather's recommending, you know, force the tenure committee to do a little work, right? Force them to tell an appropriate story in an appropriate way and, and to capture the contribution that, this, that the person that they're evaluating has, has brought up. Don't, the reason I think we, we reduce to citation counts or whatever is that it's easy, right? Not, not, not just that that's the only measure available, but that it's easy. Um, actually, I have a separate question, but just on this last point, I wanted to mention that here at the Earth Institute at Columbia, we've developed a set of practice criteria for promotion, which are already being used in promotion cases, um, which takes into account uh, alternative outputs and their evaluation, and that can include data, it can include having, you know, helping to save lives in Millennium uh, villages around the world and so forth. So uh, there are some changes. It was approved by the provost of the university, so it's, it's, okay. it's legitimized within our structure. Um, and it's somewhat related. Heather, you had a point in your slides which was about uh, impact on policy makers and practitioners, but I didn't really see much, uh, you know, discussion of how you would develop uh, quantitative metrics. I mean, I think we had a uh, examples from how the policy people look at data mm -hmm. anecdotally in the journalism world, but w what would you see as uh, quantitative metrics for impacts on policy, on decisions, on use of data in the field uh, to, you know, have beneficial, the, using the benefits of scientific data? That's a fantastic question, and I think we're not remotely there yet, right? The, the tools can't do that yet, but the way some of the first steps I think we could do um, to get there is to policymakers, if they're using the data, they're using it in some tool, right? They're bookmarking, they're downloading it, potentially they're logged in, potentially they've identified themselves as a policymaker. Uh, potentially they're bookmarking it um, somewhere. Uh, uh, like Mendeley, where maybe they've identified themselves as a policymaker. Um, potentially, they're using it in uh, one in data one R, right, to analyze it, and perhaps there they've identified themselves um, as as an affiliation that suggests um, their intended use cases. Uh, and then I think, um, ideally, we get. I think this is hard, but ideally, we get people in their outputs um, to do a better job of referencing things. Um, uh, so I think policies don't usually show the data that went into them, um, but but potentially there's ways uh, that we can move towards systems that do that better. Um, some of the very earliest places where I'm guessing this will go, I think altmetric.com is already doing this a little bit in, in tweets, is to mine those bio profiles to see if, for example, if someone's a scientist or if someone is a, is a 
uh, health clinician and then see if they're talking about papers or data sets on Twitter. That's one of the very early stages, but I think that's that's one way to go. Looking in patents is a traditional way to, to try to start to work on economic impact and things like that, yeah? Um, I, okay, one I have a, last I have question. A, I have a comment on this self-identification. So we register about 20,000 users each year oh. on NanoHub. And if you look at the stats, there's maybe 10% of the people that actually tell you who they are, what they really want to do, because many people don't know what they're going to do. So you have to almost uh, look at their behavior to figure out what they do eventually. And we know, for example, 5% of the users say they're from industry. If we survey them quietly, it's 10%. 8% of the authors are from industry. So, so there's a lot of misconception when people sign up. So sign up through Facebook and then looking at their patterns of what they might really be is much more impactful than assuming that you're getting the right answer up front. So, and it's not even ill-spirited. It, they don't necessarily know what they're going to use it for. People told them, not up is cool, go there, try it out, and they don't know what they're going to say or do. Right? So it, it's actually a process. To, to, to get the data, get the understanding. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time, so let's thank the panelists one more time. Mm.